morning. My name is Mike Lawrence. I'm lead pastor at Faith Community Church. One church, two campuses, Hopkinton and Framingham. We just opened up the new Framingham campus this past Easter, and the Faith Kids Director at Framingham went to the schools in Framingham and asked, what is it that you need that we could do? Because we always look to invest in the community. And what the Framingham school system says, we get help with clothes and coats and foods, but shoes. No one thinks to give shoes. Now this... Is this adorable or what, right? <laughs> These are special to me, because when I was in high school, that was when the Chuck Taylors first came out, right? It was a black, high-top Chuck Taylor, either white or black, Larry Bird warm. And if you were to be cool, you wanted to get a pair of Chuck Taylors, right? I remember walking into Sears, going to the athletic department, looking at the price and walking away. Didn't even bring it up with my mom. I was raised by a single mom on government assistance, and they were so expensive, I knew that it was out of bounds for us. In that moment, I realized I didn't fit in. I didn't fit in because we didn't make enough money. Now, look, at I'm an adult, and I get that. I shop the clearance rack when I go shopping, right? It just doesn't bother me now. But when you're a kid, it's a different story, where a little bit of money can change a kid's self-esteem or help them to feel fit in, or they don't stand out because of their poverty. We made just above the poverty level. That's what my mom pulled in. And so we're going to be raising, uh, we're going to actually be pulling together to come up to help a thousand kids get a pair of shoes in Framingham so that their low income uh, status or their poverty doesn't make them stand out. Now over the course of time when we've done things like this, I've gotten from the people like, oh, we talk about a thousand, what's the matter, 900 isn't good enough? Can I just be honest for a moment? Most of the time, I've had a conversation with somebody along that line is because they never grew up having to worry about making that 900. Right? If you've never had to go through life worrying about being 901 or 902, then you sit there and you complain about the stats. Wouldn't it be cool if we actually outfitted more than 1,000 kids? Everything that we bring in that the Framingham school system can't use is going to go to Project Just Because, which helps 40,000 families in this region. Let's be a church that always exceeds the expectation and jumps above the bar for kids. God, please, would you inspire us, motivate us, give us the money and the time from the forefront of our minds to help out kids? I love you, Father. Amen. So we're in a series. It's called Faces. It's a great series. It's just so adorable. You just got to do it just the right. There you go. Right. It's about relationships. It's how to fully forgive somebody. It's how to actually accept them. It's how to have that courageous conversation or to empower them with encouragement, how to serve people selflessly, the skills that lead to successful relationships. Today I want to talk about encouragement. So here's a picture of these two gentlemen. This is Thomas Watson and Thomas Watson Jr. They are two of the titans of, of the industry. They are, at different seasons, were the CEO of IBM, father and son. Now, their relationship was legendary because of the way they argued. These two guys, the dad who had kind of set the stage and grew the industry, and his son who saw the future of computers in the business world, these two guys grew this into a global enterprise, but they were known for the arguments that they would have in the hallways, the shouting matches they had in the offices, the way that the meetings could erupt in anger. As a matter of fact, the son sometimes would have to leave his dad's office, walk into another employee's office, sit down and sob because of the argument that they just had. So one day, they got an antitrust suit filed against them by the uh, United States government, which was devastating to the dad because he had built up IBM. And the last thing he wanted as he was heading towards retirement was a stain on his reputation with his suit. He wanted to fight it to prove that it wasn't right. The son could care less. The son saw actually that this suit could be an opportunity to kind of retire part of a business and really bring computers to the forefront. And they went to war with one another because dad was the CEO and the son was the president. And they were arguing over this and one time it just got so heated in the lobby of the company that the son just erupted and said, if you don't trust me, then just fire me. Walks out. 
right, and now considers quitting because he can't stand working with his dad. He pops into a cab. He's on his way, actually, to New York City to meet with lawyers from the government in a conference room with a federal judge to try to settle the antitrust suit. It was in that meeting, all keyed up with all these people in the room, lawyers from both sides, a federal judge, that his dad's secretary busts into the room and hands him a note with these six words on it. 100% confidence, admiration, appreciation, love dad. And this son, the president of IBM, in front of a federal judge, lawyers, breaks down crying. Never having heard those words from his dad. It was a life change moment. As the dad at that point turned the company over to his son and pulled away from IBM. The power of encouragement can change lives, even if you're a titan of the industry. So this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about one of the greatest and most unlikely leaders in the history of the church. Talk about Lion King. And we're going to talk about how a funeral changed my life. How's that? God, I love you. This morning, Father, I want your reputation to go through the roof. I want people to hear about Jesus Christ be moved by Jesus Christ and be changed by Jesus Christ. God, use me this morning in a way that is greater than myself. Fill me with your spirit. Speak through me to your people. Open our ears to hear what you have to say. And God, when we walk through the room, may we genuinely feel that we have experienced the living God. Change the way we live our lives that the work of Jesus would continue into the world around us. I love you. Take the moment. It's yours, Father. Amen. Some of you may have heard of the name Peter, as in Saint Peter. It's a name that's associated with Christianity. I mean, there are hospitals, there are educational institutions uh, that are named after him. Churches with his name. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous churches in the world is named after Peter. Saint Peter's Basilica, the seat of Catholicism for the whole world. And he was a pretty impressive guy. I mean, the very first message he ever preached, three thousand converts. I mean, that's, talk about a dynamic message. His exploits are legendary. This guy jumped out of a boat once and walked on water. This is a guy that was broken out of prison by an angel. He's considered to be the source of one of our Gospels, one of the four stories we have about the life of Jesus. He's uh, considered the source of two of the letters in the Bible. Paul, one of the great leaders of the church, called Peter in the letter he wrote to the church in Galatians one of the pillars of the church. And that's an impressive resume. When he died, he was actually killed, executed for his faith because he refused to renounce his faith. He was crucified like Jesus Christ, but he said, he requested that he be crucified upside down because he didn't think himself worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. What a guy, right? This is an impressive resume. But what was he really like before all of that? Sort of like in the beginning stages, Peter was actually a commercial fisherman. He wasn't a religious guy. He'd never been to Bible school. He had no profession in ministry. He was just running the family business. He didn't even, he didn't even meet Jesus of his own initiative. His brother introduced him to Jesus. And Peter was a handful. Peter was the guy that we have in the Bible arguing with Jesus over fishing. You know the miracle worker Jesus? Right? He's getting into an argument because he thought he knew better than Jesus. He did jump out of a boat and walk on water, and then immediately freaked out and started to drown. This is Peter who stood up in front of a whole gathering of people, Jesus, all those that Jesus was mentoring, we call them disciples, and he just made this bold proclamation that he would never abandon Jesus. Stand by him to the end. Within 24 hours, did not even knowing him. I mean, Jesus, to Jesus, Peter was truly a handful. And Peter was not necessarily one of the guys that you would look at and think, well, there's their leader of one of the greatest movements in the world. You just wouldn't think about that like a guy like Peter. Because Peter wasn't born to lead. Jesus forged Peter into leadership. Jesus forged Peter into leadership, and one of the tools in his tool chest was encouragement. In fact, the first time that Jesus saw Peter, he said this, Andrew, this is Peter's brother, brought Simon 
to Jesus. And looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. He looked at Peter, and the name change is because Peter, in the ancient language, really meant rock. And he looked at Peter's character, and he said, there's strength there. It doesn't matter if no one else saw the strength, Jesus see, saw it and called it out of him. Because Peter was brazen and outspoken, which were qualities that would make him a great speaker. One of the reasons that 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ was because of that brazen, outspoken nature of Peter, redirected into a good source. He was impetuous, and he was reckless, which is why he jumped out of the boat, and he's the only disciple to actually walk on water. Jesus didn't focus on the parts of Peter that were annoying, frustrating, or reckless. He thought about how those could be redirected and to do something good in the world for the cause that Jesus was building. That's called encouragement. Jesus saw a leader for the church and Peter that no one else saw. He was the first passing along the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. They weren't outstanding preachers. They weren't leaders in ministry. They weren't professionals or religious teachers. They were fishermen. But Jesus walks by them and says to them, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. He saw a potential in the future for Peter and gave him a vision of what he could become. That's called encouragement. It's taking a risk with somebody who maybe hasn't ever done this before, couldn't even imagine doing this, but giving them the words and the encouragement to step up and to step out and to become more than what they are. When Jesus looked at Peter, he, saw, he knew that Peter could be unreliable and that Peter probably would let him down when he needed his support most. He knew Peter intimately. As a matter of fact, on the last night at the su last supper that Jesus shared with him, he looks and he says to them, and Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and to death with you. And Jesus goes, I'll tell you what, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you're going to deny three times that you ever even knew me. He knew that about Peter. He knew that Peter could fold. He knew that Peter could be unreliable. He understood the frailty of humanity, the pressure of the world around him, how hard temptation can be, and how difficult it is when evil rises up against us. But Jesus also said this, but I prayed for you, Simon. I have prayed that your faith may not fall, and when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus could have said, Peter, enough. I know the truth about you that no one else knows. But instead, Jesus chose to tell Peter, I'm praying for you. Even though you're going to let me down, even though when I really need you and the pressure's on, you're going to fold like a house of cards. I want you to know I'm not leaving you. I'm standing beside you. I'm going to pray for you. And what I see inside you, Peter, is the ability to rise up past your failures and to do something good with your life after. That's called encouragement. That's the strength that we get from somebody. When we know our weaknesses and we know our failures, but they see beyond that in us into becoming something greater and doing something more than we ourselves could imagine. Helping us push past our guilt and our shame. It doesn't mean we ignore the negative. It doesn't mean we ignore the sinful behavior. It means we give a person a vision of what they can be beyond that. Instead of leaving them in the ditch, instead of leaving them in the pit, it's putting a ladder down climbing into the pit and helping them climb the ladder and getting out and walking. That's what encouragement does for people. It's a power to our lives. It creates, it creates great leaders. Because our lives can feel like this picture, a sailing vessel on the side, motionless, no direction, not fulfilling what it was designed to do. Or with some encouragement, our lives could feel like this, a wind in our sails with a new direction, heading out on full tilt, doing exactly what we were created to be. That's what, crea that's what encouragement does to a person. It fills their sails and it moves them in a new direction. It's actually an ancient Christian practice. Paul wrote this, one of the great leaders of the church, encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. He spoke encouragement to them, telling them to be encouraging. And that word encouragement is a really interesting word when you, when you stop and you pull back and begin to understand it. This is stated, by the way, by a man that you would never expect to be a leader of the church. But Jesus called him out and gave him a vision for his life and gave him the strength and the energy to move to that vision, including the forgiveness. To encourage someone 
is to call something out of them that's inside them. It's giving them the courage to rise up and to become what they could be, not necessarily what they are at the moment. It's a really beautiful word. You know what it is? It's like Lion King. You know that famous scene in Lion King where he's kind of living the Hakuna Matata life, right? Why? Because he's caught in shame and guilt. And he doesn't know how to get past that until he has this sort of mystical moment where his dad speaks to him. And his dad looks at him and he says, Simba, you are more than what you have become. That's what encouragement is. Looking at a person and saying, you are more than what you have become. To encourage someone is to put bravery, strength, courage into their hearts and into their lives. Rather than shying from the challenge, they rise up to the challenge because you fill their sails with a wind that gives them motion. And it's to build someone up. That term is actually a construction term. You know what that means in Paul's word? That was when you had a field in a blueprint, and you could see a building on it. The building's not there yet, but you have the design. You know what can happen on that place, and you rally the resources to create a building on an empty field. You know what building you up means? God has a design for you. It's in the Bible. And you may not see that in the person. Matter of fact, they may not see it. No one may see it. But when you look at a human being, what you see is what they could be in Jesus Christ because of the design that God has for their life as laid out in the Bible. You know the blueprint, and they are the field, and you know the house that they can become in Jesus Christ. It's given them a vision to become that dwelling place of God that can change the world. And I've always thought that it's sad that we have to be commanded to encourage. Because I think to myself, shouldn't we be encouraged as Christians? Because we know that every person is a child, is a, a human being forged by God. We know the plan that God has for them. And we understand the difference that Christ has made in our lives. So why should we not call out what others can become? Because somewhere, somehow, a person did that for us. God's done that for us. But for some of us, it's just not a natural mode of operation. I get that. We are naturally inclined, whether it's because of the way we were raised or it's because of the person that we are. We just see the negative in the world. We see the negative in the world and we see the negative in people and so we gravitate for the negative. That's okay. If it's a command, then it's a skill that you can develop. It's not a giftedness. It's a practice that we learn. And for others, though, there's a little bit of fear mixed in there, right? Because we're kind of afraid that if we don't point out the negative, people won't see it for themselves and they won't overcome it. We actually think that people don't know what's wrong with them unless we tell them. We almost feel like it's the divine call to tell people how bad they are. And I get it, because there are some people who are living in self-delusion, and they need to have that hard, that courageous conversation. Most of the people I've met in life already know how bad they are or how, what their weaknesses and their struggles are. But the problem is when we continuously focus on the negative in an individual, you know what we actually do? We do the word discourage. And what happens when a person is truly discouraged? They don't become the person that we see that they can become. Because they don't think that they're capable of doing it, and so they live it up. They just move on from it. And you know what else they move on? The relationship. And the saddest thing for my, and that I see in life often is a person who's trying to recapture a relationship that they destroyed because they didn't know how to encourage. Isn't that sad? Encouragement builds relationships. Discouragement destroys them. You know, you know what encouragement is? Encouragement becomes a safe place to change. Because you know that person really has your back, really loves you, and really believes in you. So when they look at you and they talk about ways to develop, warnings about your choices or issues in your life that you should address, you feel a strength to address them because you know you're not alone and they've given you the vision that you can achieve it. That's what it means to encourage. We can build people up and release them. So here's what I'm going to do, because I understand that it's not, at this point in our lives, in our history of America, encouragement isn't something we're naturally practicing. So here's a, some little three tips about how to encourage somebody. Make it personal. When I say make it personal, I mean 
Look a person in the eyes and encourage them. Here's the thing. It may feel uncomfortable to you. Isn't that sad, right? I get it, though, right? It's, it can be sad for us to look a person in the eye, encourage them, and it feels uncomfortable. If it feels uncomfortable, it's a sign that you need to do it more often. If you do it often enough, long enough, it won't feel uncomfortable anymore. Now, I wanna, this is a skill that I had to learn because it didn't feel comfortable to me. Even as a dad, it didn't feel comfortable to me to be encouraging to my kids or as a husband to my wife. Because I grew up in a family, I had a wonderful mother. I had a, when we talk about selfless serving, my mom is what taught me about selfless serving. But my mom had a terrible relationship with her mom, and my mom just didn't know how to be an encourager. My mom was one of those people, like if it was three A's and a B, guess what she focused on? Because she saw a potential in me that she wanted to see me to achieve, and just her approach to life was to focus on what needed to be fixed, which discouraged me as a kid. It wasn't until the funeral, it wasn't until the wake for the funeral, when I was standing in line, and people would coming through the line were telling me the things my mother said about me that were kind and hopeful. Talking about my achievements and my potential. I was stunned. So I made a commitment. I made a commitment that my children would not have to wait until I die to hear the good that I had to say about them. I made the commitment that my wife shouldn't have to wait for me to perish before she would hear how highly I thought of her. It was not easy. It was awkward. It was just determination is what changed the ship and began to fill the sails of other people like that. I want that to be my inheritance to them. And when you make it personal, can I say that touch matters? You should embrace your family. Teenagers should not have to go into sexual relationships in order to feel the intimacy of a touch. They should feel the intimacy of a touch growing up in their lives. Do you know that if you, the more you touch an infant, you're helping them bond with other people, develop their emotions, and to help their own brains develop? Kids who aren't touched suffer in life. Physical touch matters. You know, it'd be appropriate with people you're not related to, right? You know? That's the squeeze the shoulder, do the fist bump sort of thing. Human touch encourages people. Make it personal. And don't be vague, right? Or be specific. Don't be vague. It's not really encouraging when you look at a person and say, yeah, you're a good employee. You're typically late. You're not friendly with customers, but yeah, you're good. We're, when we tend to be specific with our criticism and vague in our compliment, guess what people focus on? We all focus on the specifics. But when you look at a person and you say, you know what, people really like working with you. You're funny and you're engaging. I would love to see you apply that a little bit more with customers because I think you could raise our sales. It's the same thing, but packaged with specific encouragement. And then recognize the potential in a person. I mean the actual potential, because one of the worst lies that we feed our kids is you can do whatever you want in life. Uh-huh, that's why we have all those really awkward audition segments on America's Got Talent. So I think to myself, did no one at some point tell you you have no musical skill whatsoever? I mean, honestly, you are just not funny. Why should Simon Cowell be the first person to say that? So when I talk about recognizing the potential, I mean actual potential. It's what I love about our volunteer process here at the church. We help people discover how God has designed them to serve. It's so fulfilling when they find a place in the church to serve because we come alongside you and we have a process we use that identifies um, the gifts that God has given you and the passions that he's put in our, your heart and the abilities you have and the personality he's given you, the experiences you have in life. And then we find a place for you to serve where all that comes alive. Our equipping ministry is designed by and filled with people who see the potential in a human being. We can help anyone find a place to serve in this church. Because we believe that God has equipped everyone to serve. You know, and especially, i got to say this, teenagers and kids today need adults to encourage them. That's why we're so into family ministries. So we love faith kids and student ministries, and we're calling out people to serve in those ministries. Because in those ministries are future CEOs, future world leaders, 
doctors, teachers, pastors, people who will change the world for Jesus Christ. You know what they need? They need someone to do for them what Jesus did for Peter. You can do that. If you don't see the potential inside yourself, you can call out the potential in, in, out of someone else, and then you will be amazed at how God has used you. I do want a little warning with this whole message. This is not an excuse to stay in an unhealthy relationship. You know that thing which is, well, you don't see the good in him, but I see it right. He shouldn't be hitting me. Or you know that, I know that she can do better. She just needs someone to believe in her. Yeah, she has an addiction and she's stealing from me. I like, I like to spoil my kids. How much debt are you in? He'll make a great husband or father someday, but yeah, but shouldn't he be faithful now? Sometimes we're trapped in relationships and we're an encur- we think we're an encourager, but we're actually an enabler. What you need to do is to listen to the people in your life who are saying, hey, you got to look at this a little bit differently. And maybe get some help from the church, like stop by the hub and connect with a pastor to help you maybe think through this relationship a little bit differently. It really does encourage somebody. This whole series, right? Think about this. You can encourage somebody by forgiving them, to lift the burden of guilt and shame, to help them discover the freedom they can have in Jesus Christ. You help a person, you encourage them when you accept them. Maybe they've never been accepted, they don't feel accepted, they don't feel they fit in, but then you accept them, and they're encouraged, and it's like wind in their sails. You might have the first courageous, kind conversation with a person that encourages them or by serving them selflessly, sacrificially investing into someone else's life to have a person that believes in them and invest time into them encourages people but I understand that sometimes it's hard to be encouraging when you don't feel encouraged because you're bearing the weight of your past failures it's hard to forgive somebody when you have never felt forgiven when you're bearing the weight of your own shame and guilt. It's hard, right? It's hard if past relationships have been difficult for you. How do you accept somebody when you have never felt accepted yourself? How do you have that kind conversation with somebody when no one's ever had that kind conversation with you? Selflessly serve, you feel alone because you don't have anyone in your life that's investing into you and serving you. This is where faith makes a difference. You are a child of God. You have been designed by God from birth. God has a destiny for you that he has laid out. His plans for you are good plans. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. You can be the light of the world so people see Jesus Christ in you and through you. You can be the voice of God to someone who's never heard the voice of God before. God has saved you, ransomed you, and pulled you out of your past and given you a new identity and a new purpose. You have been washed clean of your past. Your sins, the things that you're ashamed of, that you hide, God has forgiven. Christ pursued you when you felt lost. When you felt worthless, he saw worth in you. God has sealed you by his spirit and given you a future that can never be taken away. There is hope for you. There is peace for you. There is joy for you because the spirit of God that he gives to you changes you and fills you with that. I don't care what your father was like. You have an eternal heavenly father who is as good as good can be and loves you. Start there. God, what a moment. Father, I love you because you have changed me. You have reset me. You have redesigned me. You have renewed me. You have regenerated me and given me life. The destiny that you've given me is a marvelous destiny I could never have crafted. And the way that you have answered my prayers, (laughs) I could never have anticipated those answers. The goodness that you have poured out into my life is far beyond what I ever could have imagined possible. You are a good father. 